Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm John Horwich, the President and CEO of Easter Seals DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Our vision is to create a hopeful, inclusive community where all people realize their potential and live meaningful lives. Realize, realizing our vision of hope requires supporting caregivers. As Rosalind Carter shared when she was a special guest at our Advocacy Awards dinner, there are only four kinds of people in the world those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver. In fact, it was when my mom was diagnosed with cancer and I was worrying about how to support her that I first became involved with Easter Seals. That's why it's such an honor to present today's webinar. We have an amazing panel of Easter Seals partners who are experts in the field, including Rushern Baker, the former county executive of Prince George's County, Maryland, whose wife has been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease and who's been a wonderful partner in helping us grow services in the county. Marcus Bolston, the director of Easter Seals Morris and Gwendolyn Kafritz Adult Day Services, whose program supports adults with medical needs and disabilities as well as their caregivers. Sheila Griffin, the program manager at the Alzheimer's Association, our partner in training caregivers of individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And Conwell Smith, the Chief External Affairs Officer of our longtime partner, the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers, that is a leading provider of caregiver supports across the caregiving spectrum. I also want to thank our partner Comcast for sponsoring today's important webinar. Now I'm pleased to turn the program over to James Smith. James serves as the Vice President of Development at Easter Seals DC, Maryland, Virginia, and as someone who's recently become a caregiver himself, supporting his mom, we hope you will ask many of the questions the audience wants to have addressed. If you are logged into Zoom, please feel, to at, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box. Now I'm gonna turn it over to James and you'll also see a uh, poll come up on your screen and we'd appreciate it if you would answer the poll. Thank you, John, so much. I appreciate the introduction and a warm welcome to all of our, our great panelists who are joining us today uh, for candid conversations. And uh, we have had the opportunity to kind of do some uh, talking prior to coming online. And so it really is a conversation that we're gonna have today about a very important subject uh, that we all feel very passionate about. And that's how do we help people who are aging uh, in place? And so our panelists come today from different perspectives. So I, I'd like to open up by asking each of you, uh, from your perspective, what is the number one challenge you're hearing from caregivers today about people who are aging in place? Well, at I can Rosa, at the, oh, I'm sorry. At, oh, the Rosa ahead, Carter, at the Rosa and Carter Institute, we find that uh, the unpredictable schedules and the, the hours caregiving involves really tends to be one of the largest challenges. You know, it makes finding time to do everything seem impossible um, because there aren't enough hours in the day. And so balancing that schedule and making sure that you're also owning some time for yourself as a caregiver is, uh, is probably the number one challenge that we see. I was gonna add, a, uh... Uh, at the Alzheimer's Association with um, the nature of Alzheimer's disease and um, memory loss, this is, um, a, has a huge impact on, on families, uh, the, uh, your, the person with the diagnosis as well as the whole family. Mm -hmm. And um, this stress of uh, you know, knowing that a person is slowly um, losing uh, their memories and um, that, that it's just a, it's something that um, caregivers have a hard time with and really um, struggle with. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah. No, I would agree. I mean, I think uh, finding the balance between your life and caring for your loved one is the toughest part um, because, you know, many of the people who are caregivers, as we were talking um, off, off, camper, off camera, um, many of the folks who are caregivers also have a family of their own that they're caring for in addition to either the parent or loved one uh, that they're caring for. And so finding that balance where you can take care of your loved one, take care of your, your daily problems and issues that you face just being 
you know, a, a person and then finding time for yourself so you can rejuvenate and be able to do all those things is a really difficult balance, especially in the first year to two years of any situation. Yeah, and I'd like to add um, on, on top of that, I think everyone made a really great point. Um, something I'd like to mention is um, just the social circle that happens tends to get smaller within aging. And so even for the caregivers, that social circle is very small. So finding someone to talk about it with, you know, finding a mental health care professional or someone to support with that caregiver burnout is something that I often hear. That's a great point, all of you, thank you. I have a question because I, as John uh, alluded to in the introduction, I'm coming into this space. Uh, my mother uh, just last week was diagnosed uh, with uh, stage one cancer. And so I find myself moving into now uh, this role of being uh, her care provider uh, while, while I'm working and trying to maintain my own sense of, as you all said, your own sense of balance, right? And so what advice do you, do you offer uh, to caregivers who are like me, just coming into this space and all of a sudden you got this news that really literally transforms your life and everything in a moment. How do you, how do you, what advice would you give someone like me to, as I'm coming into this space? Well, I think, you know, if I can just start off, um, one, I want to thank Easter Seals for putting together this program. It's very important uh, that we get the word out to as many people as possible, especially those who don't think they're going to be caregivers, who mm -hmm. aren't prepared for that, especially at a stage of their life. And so with that, the first thing is, and, and I tell people, the best way for me to teach people about caregiving is to talk about the mistakes I made, which were plenty. And the first one was not asking for help, uh, not confiding into family members, both what the disease is, but more importantly, how are you feeling about it? And so if I could say anything to folks, it would be one, get as much information, but also get a support network and ask for help. And, and two, be honest with family members throughout so that that support network can, can, can broaden. And I, and I think that's, that's the first thing I would say to folks. Sure, and I would echo that. Um, probably my most important role in life right now is, is being a caregiver for a father with Alzheimer's. So when you recognize that 42, 42 million adults are caring for somebody 50 years and older, and over half of those caregivers, 56%, are themselves over the age of 50. And so, you know, that's translating in excess of 20 million older adults who are caring for another older adult. Right. I, was so, I was so pleased to hear Marcus a moment ago talk about that support structure getting small. Um, what thing you do find when you are caring for a loved one is that you don't have the time to be there for your friends. And so I have learned personally that you have to say so. You have to tell your friends, I'm so sorry I've been absent. It is, it is not because I don't want to be with you because it is amazing the support that you gain by opening yourself up and showing that vulnerability. And the other side to that, to, to self-care is that recognition that for those caregivers that are over 70 or over 80, a lot of their friends have already gone. And so they may not have that best friend that they always relied on 10 years prior. Mm -hmm. and so making sure that they have somewhere to go, somewhere where they can speak any truth and feel comfortable and feel accepted and feel whole is so critical for the aging population. Thank you. Thank you, Conwell. Marcus, anything that you'd like to add to that? Um, yes, um, just from your standpoint, James, I would always recommend um, getting people to the direct resources that they need. And a lot of times people turn to Google as the first resource, right? Like, who do I, what do I put in the search bar <laughs> to find a resource that I need? Not knowing that many states and Maryland being one of the best of them puts these resources in a, in a, in a box for you and presents it to you. Um, so, you know, Maryland access point is a, a link to health and supports in Maryland that I always try to reference and share. And there you can research supports and resources 
by what you're specifically looking for and by region. Um, so it's a great resource um, if you need a, a support group or, or help with transportation or uh, telephone resources. It's just a very broad um, space that you can look to start your search. Thank you. I want to shift the conversation just a little, and I appreciate that guidance. I'm um, again coming into this space. One of the things that I've always uh, told my mother uh, when she retired, it's, you know, I need you to stay active. I need you to keep your, your brain function healthy. Like I would call her and say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm watching TV. No, I need you to kind of do a crossword puzzle or, or do something that kind of exercises uh, your, your thinking skills, your cognitive skills. How do you help uh, seniors, right, who are coming into uh, that quote unquote aging in place, what does that, how do you help them to define what that looks like? How do they reset their lives around physical activity, mental stimulation? How do, how do we help them? You know, I'd love to jump in and just let you know what the Alzheimer's Association, we get that question a lot. I'm caring for somebody maybe with Alzheimer's disease. Is there anything I can do as a caregiver? And even with my loved one who has a disease, is there something we can do to sort of preserve cognitive ability or really just help exercise our brains? And um, I, I saw our website, alz.org, um, uh, in the chat. And if you go to our website, we have a great um, several great education programs where we talk about doing things like um, managing yourself physically, even if you're not somebody who goes out and runs regularly, doing something physical on a regular basis, looking at your diet and trying to figure out, is this the best diet for me based on my, my health um, history and, and what I have going on in my loved one? Um, social, we, we count that just as heavily as we do diet and, uh, and exercise. Social, am I connecting socially? And we'll probably talk about social isola isolation uh, in a bit with our seniors, but socially, just making sure we're continuing um, to uh, just get, that, get ourselves out there. And then last is cognitively. And so you're very good to tell your mom to do crossword puzzles if she enjoys them and if they really do it for her, but um, any way you can challenge yourself. Uh, so the, the two top things we always say at the Alzheimer's Association, if you really wanna get your brain active and, and working is to learn another language or to learn a musical instrument. <laughs> so as adults, those are the two hardest things for us to really sit down and start to learn, but it's a great uh, great exercise for your brain. I think I should, I should take advice on that. <laughs> yeah, we all should. <laughs> uh, Richard, and any, you wanna jump in here? Yeah, you know, I, Sheila, just uh, great advice. One of the things that we did for my wife um, as she was at the beginning stages after we found out information was she used to speak French as a child. She started school in a French school. And so at 50, we started doing the French lessons and we even did our last trip with her abroad to Paris so that we were just trying to get her brain to function. And it was great. You know, it gave us, you know, probably a couple of more years of her being cognizant and and being able to communicate and the exercising. You know, she loved to walk. In the very beginning when she was diagnosed, I was afraid uh, to let her go out um, because I just didn't know enough. After I found out the information, we went on daily walks, um, always did crossword puzzles because that's what she likes. Um, but certainly the language piece and the exercising were some of the best advice we got. And then doing the um, activity. So in the very beginning, I would take her with me to work and uh, we would do those things just to keep her stimulated with company, but also her brain and physical activity. Marcus, I'm curious to how you would respond considering your role with Easter Seals and adults actually coming to our, our day services. I, I'd love to hear your take on uh, how you keep our adult population cognitively active. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we start with an assessment um, to figure out what the, the participants uh, enjoy or used to enjoy. Um, and then we tailor their enrichment activities based on what they particularly like. Um, and, you know, it's been a, a bit of a blessing that we've been able to um, enhance our virtual programming so that we can have a broader reach 
and also bring in some of our performers who were away from the pandemic. Um, and so we often work with a lot of different agencies who provide um, musical performers, um, you know, they do um, theater, they do dance, everything is very, um, everything is very active and engaging and stimulating. Mm -hmm. so the arts, the music um, and fine arts are actually very much a part of our program to keep them stimulated. Um, and then I want to piggyback off of the language piece. Um, learning new languages is also an excellent idea. Um, our program in particular has a bilingual Spanish um, uh, po population, so everyone gets to participate in a little bit of beginner Spanish, right, and learn some new skills. Um, but one thing I wanted to mention about, um, you know, dementia and Alzheimer's in general, you know, as it progresses, there's a phenomena called sundowning. Um, and usually during the latter part of the day, there's a time when, when people will, will become anxious or agitated. Um, and we found that, you know, certain um, activities like manipulatives or uh, sensory activities, you know, using things that you can touch and feel and smell, or even an iPad that has, you know, a, a game like Fruit Ninja on it will keep a very active mind much calmer, which will give you an opportunity to communicate with them and help them to redirect from some of that anxiety. Awesome. Um, I, uh, at some point, you know, we, we, we think about, again, aging in place, and, and we, we try to give our loved ones all of the, the resources that they need to in, in their home because it's comfortable, they're used to the environment. Um, at what point do you start thinking about when to transition into adult day services? When does when do you get to that stage uh, in, if you will, the process? And and how do you go about identifying, you know, with the myriad of services that are available, which is the right provider? How do you align with, you know, a particular need? So at, when you trying to navigate that space, what advice would you give caregivers there? Um, I think uh, I can start. Um, I, I think that um, you want to first identify whether or not you want someone in the home to support you. Um, some people do not want someone in the home, you know, necessarily. So then how do you get that support outside the home? Mm -hmm. um, and then figuring out whether or not you need a real respite or if you need, you know, four hours or you need, you know, five days a week level of support. Um, and then from there, you know, once you kind of identify the type of services that you're looking for, you can start to reach out to, you know, the different agencies. And the most important thing is just recognizing that there is a variety of supports. So you need to just figure out, you know, which ones you like and tour and try them all and, and see what's the best fit for you. Obviously, the Rosalind Carter Institute has some caregiver support programs. So a lot of times when there's a caregiver that's had that emergency room moment of care, that they're, they're just desperate to, to figure out just even basic decision making because, because they're feeling overwhelmed. And these are all very important issues. Well, sometimes we have that discussion. Um, and, and what we've learned are some important questions for putting your care recipient in anyone else's hands are making sure what the policy for communication is, you know, making sure how are they going to communicate with the family member or, or the prior caregiver or the main caregiver. And also, you know, how do they deal with a stressful situation? What made them go into this field? You know, what is their driving mission? All of these things are, are value propositions that, that we must feel comfortable with when we're dealing with our most precious commodity which is that loved one. So, mm -hmm. um, so I would just encourage everyone to ask the questions that weigh heavy on you. And don't be afraid to, to ask those questions so that you yourself as a caregiver can feel comfortable. Um, it, it's just, it's so important that we're not only addressing the care of the recipient, but we're addressing the anxiety of the caregiver. So both things have to happen at the same time. Thank you, that, that's good to know. Sheila, I see you unmuted, so please. I wanted to just add that I think uh, I thought of something as, as Conwell was saying that, that um, a lot of times you are overwhelmed as a caregiver and somebody else said, oh, Rashern, you said that you wish you would have asked for help sooner. So it doesn't mean that you have to say, 
somebody come in and relieve me completely and just, you know, I'm losing my mind. But if you could even just get a buddy like me at the Alzheimer's Association, or I bet Marcus would be a good buddy too, to just um, talk about things. Is, is this the right thing for my loved one? What is the right thing for my, sometimes we don't know what the right thing is for our loved one. We just know we have to do something. And we um, at the Alzheimer's Association here at the National Capital Area chapter, we, we kind of will be your Google service for you in a way. So I can tell you what um, adult day centers are around you or within, you know, however many miles. I can't lead you to it. I can't enroll your loved one. Um, but I, it sometimes it just helps having a person at the other end of the phone or on a virtual call to just say, uh, you, you, yes, I think you need help. And yes, I think you should try this. And, um, and then that, that's sometimes what we need is, is that leading hand or buddy. <laughs> Thank you. I want to remind all of you who are uh, watching and streaming us that we are engaged in a poll. And so if you haven't had the opportunity to uh, complete that, if we if you can do that over the next few minutes, because we're going to come to those results uh, shortly. Uh, but here I want to pause and talk about uh, what has upended the entire world. COVID-19 and what impact COVID-19 potentially uh, from your perspective and lens has had on aging in place uh, for the person, the senior, you know, I think uh, Sheila, you talked earlier and mentioned the words uh, social isolation, right? And being, what, what, what have we seen as a result of COVID uh, that we'll have to deal with from moving forward, right? Because I, I don't think as, as we look, we're certainly not out of the woods. Uh, I think that COVID, uh, as much as we think that we're turning the corner, you know, here's another variant that is, is causing us to kind of rethink uh, how we engage uh, with each other and community. So I'm curious uh, to hear your all of your thoughts about the impact of COVID on aging in place and, and how does that change the dynamic uh, as we move uh, in, a, in a quote unquote post-COVID environment? James, uh, the Rosalind Carter Institute did a did a, a study in the fall um, that proved that 83% of caregivers were dealing with just exceptional anxiety um, mm. and isolation in COVID during COVID. So we know that it has had an impact. A lot of the reason why so much uh, attention is being put to respite is because we know that that was largely what was lost during the pandemic. There was no escape, if you will. Um, you know, a lot of the organizations, you know, day, some of the day services and whatnot were not available. Um, even your friends, you were careful about being around your friends. And so <laughs> there was such a lack of connectedness. Um, if anything has shown us that self-care, it must be a priority for any caregiver, both for the benefit of the caregiver and the care recipient, it has been what we've gone through this past year and a half. Um, Everyone needs to schedule time for themselves and they need to fiercely protect that time. Um, whether it's a video chat with friends or family um, or talking to somebody who might understand your situation uh, or reaching out to those family members that can just maybe, maybe take some pressure off for a little while. All of those things are linchpins to keeping your own sanity and making sure that you're healthy. Um, the Rosalind Carter Institute spends all of our focus on the unpaid and family caregiver and recognizing that caregiving alone um, is a social determinant of health. It makes us a vulnerable, vulnerable population. You, yeah. miss, you miss doctor's appointments, you miss, and that's in a good year. So imagine what that was for COVID. Right. Um, it's so critical to make sure that the caregiver doesn't eventually become the recipient, right? So, mm -hmm. so these things go hand in hand and we must pay attention to healthy caregiving uh, in addition to healthy caregiving of. I wanna, before we go to others, I wanna follow up with you, Cornwell, on that. So do you have there, were there any new emerging trends or strategy or innovative ways uh, as a result of COVID that have been introduced to self-care and caregiving when, when there's, you know, in this, again, post-COVID situation? At RCI, we were fortunate that we already had virtual programming 
um, we weren't all in person, mm -hmm. but that virtual programming, as Marcus said earlier, is such it's an added benefit. Um, you know, and think about telemedicine, for example, how far telemedicine has come this past year that has been a silver lining to a rough year, um, because there are a lot of times when that can make all the difference for a caregiver when they're aging in place, especially if they're if if both parties are elderly, if you can address a concern of yours without getting in a car and driving a half an hour down the road, then all the better. So I think you're having more support programs be available in more ways and meeting people where they are. And that is absolutely a silver lining to all that we've been through. Thank you. Others want to chime in on, on that same question. I would, James, echo the same thing that we, uh, you know, we were all in person. We had, we actually had very little virtual programming at the Alzheimer's Association prior to pandemic. And we pivoted and uh, really got probably 80% uh, of our programs, which are caregiver support groups, as well as uh, memory cafes for those who um, have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And um, mostly got everything virtual, about 80% of it virtual. Now we're finding when here in our area, uh, in, uh, wa in Washington, DC, Maryland area, that, okay, we're going back in person, we're going slowly, and interestingly, we're finding that the caregivers really want more options. They want that virtual option. They are not ready to go back to the library or the, or the community center to meet with these other caregivers. They, they found how valuable this is. And um, so we know now we need to have more options, not just in person, but we have to have both. We have to have a hybrid, mm -hmm. um, hybrid opportunities. And if I can just say, um, I just met, uh, uh, Conwell was absolutely right. I know with us, you know, we had a routine um, for my wife and those who, um, who help out uh, and also our children. And when COVID hit, my wife and I actually had to separate from, you know, our daughters uh, for the first time, you know, ever, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was, you know, the first couple of, you know, weeks or so with just the two of us in an apartment was fine. Um, after a while, though, you start to notice, at least I did, that, you know, I never really did a straight, you know, 60 days of just the two of us in an apartment, isolated, mm -hmm. other than Zoom, by ourselves. So in my case, my wife is not verbal anymore. Um, that's never been a problem in the past, but after 60 days, it became a problem. Mm -hmm. And so the point of it is, is understanding that the caregivers need support more than ever because of things like the pandemic, which if you're dealing with a person with Alzheimer's, it messes up their routine, mm -hmm. what they're used to. Right. It also messes up your routine of what you don't consider a respite. But it really is when you are able to go to the grocery store or go to work for a couple of hours or have your kids come by and take up some of the time. Mm -hmm. um, those things we need to be mindful. And then the last thing I would say that I think COVID really, for me, at least in terms of healthcare, uh, brought it brought home is that if you notice when they were giving out shots for COVID-19 vaccinations, mm -hmm. There was a great plan for people going and standing in line. There also was a plan for folks who were in nursing home, but we're talking about aging in place. Hmm. Those of us who had a loved one that was in the house with us where we could not transport them, there was really not at the beginning stages uh, a, a situation where they could come to the home um, in a way that mirrored what was going on, on the outside. By that, I mean, you know, people were starting to loosen up because they got their shots, they could go out. Um, but it was an extra 60 to 30 days before my wife could get her shot, where we would feel comfortable with folks both coming into the house and me leaving the house. And so I think it's something that we have to be mindful of as we talk about aging in place to make sure that those same support systems that are provided by the government, social services, and our nonprofits for individuals in a uh, nursing home, that we also make sure that we can provide that at their house. Uh, telemed telemedicine was excellent. It, it saved 
it saves us a lot. I was able to get her physical done and talk to her neurologist because of that. But the other things have to go with it. You raise a great point, and I want to pick your brain now on the public policy side, giving your experience as a former county executive, right? How, how do we engage uh, our local, state, and even federal elected officials around policies that impact aging in place, right? Um, who, who advocates for those individuals and caregivers? How does that message resonate uh, in such a way that things like this, there's a pandemic, here are shots, but clearly the people who are aging in place are not in, immediately benefiting from that. So that's a policy issue I think that you've raised that uh, it's, right. to, heretofore I wasn't even thinking about it until you just mentioned it. No, and, and, and neither was I. First, first of all, everyone on the panel, I want to thank you for doing what you do, because you're really providing not just the actual services, but influencing the policymakers. Mm -hmm. And when we come out of something like a pandemic, uh, we've got to remind those policymakers who have gone through this, like myself, that right there, you know, I remember having a conversation with my children, and they said, well, they said, well, daddy, why don't you just call somebody because you're the former county executive. I said, but I shouldn't have to. What if I'm not the former county executive and I don't know who to call? I need the government to understand it has to work this way. As a policymaker and somebody who wants to influence policies, as we're doing our debriefing about what went wrong in the pandemic, that's got to be part of it of how we miss the people who are in, who are in, who are aging at home, which is what we want to do for everybody. And so these little things. Um, or what we have to remind policymakers um, to include when they're doing a comprehensive bill. I know for me, I, I say this all the time, I never understood the importance of family bathrooms until my wife got Alzheimer's. Mm. Um, it just, my daughters were grown, my son was grown. It never really occurred to me how important that could be until I was somewhere and could not take her to be changed because she wasn't sick enough so people would know it. Um, and she wasn't well enough to go to a restroom by herself. Mm -hmm. And here I am, the county executive, and I can't figure out how to change my wife. Um, so I immediately went back and said, every facility we do, I want to know how many family bathrooms are there. How many bathrooms can everybody go in? Those are the things that you can do to help policymakers to make it real for them so that they're including that as they make decisions. Thank you. I would, like, I would like to add to that. Every positive change is a positive change. And so, you know, we want the moonshot. Absolutely. We want, we want caregivers to be seen and understood and reimbursed and all of those things. But there's nothing wrong with incremental change at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, am, I am very encouraged that Congress right now is focusing on home and community-based services in the Medicaid population and giving states a little more flexibility to do those things like reimbursing a family or unpaid caregiver. Um, and I think they will absolutely find that outcomes will be improved and that will probably even save money by people being in a home setting versus in an, in an institution. Um, but that Medicaid population is also a small part of the population. So I think we also need to look at that as the opportunity to pilot programs that could be used in private insurance or be used in Medicare or be, be used more broadly because we do know there is a gap in services for those that are that are based at home. Um, you know, we, we need domestic workers to be paid better, but we also need to understand that that has to have the reimbursement lever arm or otherwise the unpaid and family caregiver will be spending more as well. So we need to know how all of these things fit together so that we are giving those supports to those who need them. Um, you know, this really is a crisis in our country. You look at the baby boom population and mm -hmm. just the vast numbers of people that need care and we we can and should do better. Absolutely. And th 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 this question actually feeds into a great question that we received uh, from one of our, our, our uh, attendees. And that is, what are some of the best things you can do if your aging parents live in another state to support them and prepare them for aging in place? What are your thoughts there? 
definitely get them get them involved with those resources that that Marcus was speaking of. Every state has a list of resources and has has departments of aging that you can go to to try to find out who can service them. And if they are aging in place, that means they either have a, a paid caregiver or there is someone within the home that is doing that caregiving. Whoever that person is, make sure that they're getting their own care addressed. Mm -hmm. um, I can't stress that enough um, because you don't want this time in their lives to life to be the tense time in their life. You want them to to find joy in it, and there is so much joy in in end of life issues, in caregiving, in being together at those moments that are. Let's be honest; they're all that matter. At the end of the day, it's all that matters are those loved ones that are around us and how we're going to treat one another. And so um, just make sure that they are in touch with those resources that keep their head above water and find out what organizations such as Marcus's are available to give that, that so important respite, need for respite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to um, thank you, Ms. Conwell. I, I would like to just add um, about the importance of representation. Um, if an individual needs representation, you need to identify that, whether or not they need a power of attorney for health and medical or a financial uh, representation. Um, that's so important because if you start with a strong foundation and go through, uh, go through it with them and help them identify that, whether or not they need um, you know, those things or, or maybe even a most uh, a medical uh, document determining you know what's going to happen if they if they have an accident those things are going to help them along the way um, it's going to help them be more secure um, when they need to you know enter into a program or you know handle things month to month financially no james i was going to say also that i think um i agree with everything uh, marcus and cronwell have said and what the question read, read to me like was that this is a long distance caregiver, whether it's an adult child or long distance caregivers, that's a real thing. And you're, you're a caregiver, <laughs> just like everything we've talked about. So try to get your care team together, whether it's uh, other friends, family, uh, other people who can get there, you know, to see your parent um, quickly, you know, within, you know, however, however far they are, you know, you've got to jump on a plane or however you got to have to get there. You have to have somebody who can put their eyes on them or you should be able to. And that can be there or a neighbor, somebody you can trust, but getting your care team together now uh, rather than later and thinking about that. What are the resources in their area? And, um, but, but making sure you have somebody who is close by that you can count on to, to get the real story sometimes. That, that's, I appreciate that having the care team together. I wrote that down because I'm gonna, I need to start putting mine together uh, <laughs> now. But I, have a, I wanna pivot and go a little deeper in that, in that same kind of uh, thinking. Um, and I need all of your help and advice around this. Um, how, do you, how do you navigate through the time and space when your parent is aging in place and still can make some decisions for him or herself? but yet you are, you can kind of see down the line that you got to make some decisions, right? And so I just one appointment last week <laughs> with my mother's physician. Um, my mother and I were butting heads about her care. <laughs> and she reminded me that, you know, she was still in charge and dot, 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 which I understood. And, you know, I want to uh, value her independence and her own sense of self and being able to make decisions for herself. But at the same time, I'm moving into the space of caregiver, right? And so how do you navigate through that space where you're, you're being sensitive to your parent, the person for which you are providing care, but yet you see other things that they may not see that you wanna kind of be respectful of how to manage through that, that early space. So I would, I would love to hear your advice and your wise counsel on how to kind of navigate through that space. You know, protecting the integrity of the care recipient is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and one way that, that this can be approached is providing choices. Um, you can imagine in their own care, they're also overwhelmed. Um, you know, there's, there's an emotional overwhelming, um, if not a, an actual physical overwhelming. 
So redirecting task at hands to provide choices and giving anyone that you are caring for a feeling of control is mm. is really important. It's part of valuing who they are. So um, so keeping emotions at bay, trying to provide choices, trying to create parameters around the discussion that gives them that say, um, but that is softly guided, uh, I think is, is a very good approach to having those discussions. And I'm not saying that I, even as an employee of RCI, am particularly good at this. Um, I, I feel you, I feel you, James. Um, but I, I do try to remind myself that, uh, that it's very important for people to have a say and a control in their own mm -hmm. life. And I think that even goes with dementia as long as it can. You know, I think it's very important that we're giving those choices and that we're letting people feel their own wholeness in the situation. Mm. And having Thanks. those conversations is what's so important is to, to especially with Alzheimer's or uh, dementia, talking to them sooner rather than later, because right. right now is the time at the earliest point that we can really talk about how your care is going to go and really hear about what your apprehension is. You know, I think it's difficult to receive care too. It's, we know caregivers, it's hard to, to, to balance all of these um, balls in the air and, and to provide good care to our loved one. But sometimes it's also hard to receive care and keeping that in mind. No, I think, I think they're, you're both right. And that is you want to maintain that independence but at the same time, you want to be prepared. And so having that conversation early and then at the same time uh, preparing, whether it's a power of attorney, whether it's where the accounts are, what your um, I always use the example. I couldn't pay our Verizon bill because my wife knew all the codes and I never bothered to learn them. <laughs> uh, but making sure that you have that conversation, sure you're ready, but you definitely want them to be as independent as possible and to know that it's, you know, that they're navigating for as long as possible their own health care mm -hmm. and so um i i think you're doing exactly right but make sure you're prepared because you don't know when they're going to lose the ability no matter what the disease is mm -hmm. um to make those decisions and so you want to be prepared for that sure Thank you. Um, let me ask one question before we go into the poll. I want to look at the results and, and kind of get your thoughts uh, from reactions from our from our attendees. Um, uh, let's think about the, the cost of long term care and insurance for some of these options that we're talking about in terms of aging in place. Um, it's, it seems like, a, you know, a tremendous you almost have to have a PhD in insurance policy <laughs> to kind of navigate through how you provide uh, long-term care, right? It's those who are aging in place. Uh, Marcus, I'd love to hear your thoughts um, considering Easter Seal's approach. Uh, obviously that the people, families that come to our center, um, I would use some type of insurance to help offset some of those fee services. What advice do you have uh, to people who are kind of getting into that space and trying to determine how to how to pay for this. Yeah, um, we, we run into a lot of different scenarios financially um, at the end of life. Right. And mm -hmm. so for for our program here, we have about five or six different funding sources that we work with. Um, I can give you some. We work with Medicaid, adopt foster care, senior care, veterans, um, veterans affairs. Um, and Montgomery County respite, um, and some long-term care insurances. So it just depends on where you may find yourself financially, um, how you, which, which um, route you can go. Um, if it's Medicaid, it ends up being um, um, a situation where you have to manage the finances financially so that you don't have too much money so that you're not covered through the waiver that allows them to attend, say, an adult medical daycare. Mm -hmm. um, there's also um, a, a program called PACE, which is a program of all-inclusive care for elderly um, with, with Medicare and Medicaid, and, and that's a resource that you want to look into in terms of other resources like um, in-home care or transportation or nursing home stays. So there are some, some different types of financial resources out there. 
Thank you. And our colleagues here at East of Seals put a, a link into the chat feature uh, so people can have that resource. And while they're doing that, I'm going to ask uh, if we can see the results from the poll. Uh, wow, that's pretty great. So uh, the first question, what type of caregiver are you? Um, and so about 38 uh, percent of our participants today have an aging parent or loved one and want to learn more. Uh, some no direct connection. So we have a, a, a split here in terms of our, our thinking. And if we look at the second question, what uh, caregiver issue concerns you? Um, it looks like the top two would be assessing essential resources. Uh, we've talked a little bit about that. And then uh, the mental and physical strain associated with caregiving duties. Uh, we, and we talked about that. Um, so let's kind of go a little deeper. Is there a such thing as a support group? Um, do they emerge? How do, how do people kind of get into that space with other caregivers uh, so that they don't feel overwhelmed or, or isolated? James, at, at the Rosalind Carter Institute, we have various caregiving programs, but um, but one of our programs is in the veteran space and, and it's a one-on-one -on -one long, uh, long program for the caregiver. But recently we have been, we have been working with the Wounded Warrior Project to look at this, the group caregiving um, and, and really using the same approach, evidence-based approach that we were using in the one-on-one, -on -one, but doing it in a group. And it's going to be very interesting to compare the two and find out, you know, are there different personalities that benefit from one versus the other um, are, you know, ju just to kind of find out, is it more beneficial to do a one-on-one -on -one first and then join a group? But we really do believe in, in evidence-based programs and trying to collect as much data as we can about those caregivers so that we can start to build out programming um, in, in a more personalized way. But definitely there are resources available and, and we encourage people to pursue those resources that speak to them and, and that meet them where they are. And that may be that it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, or it may be that they want to be a group of, in a group of like-minded individuals. I know that uh, Sheila and, and others provide various places where people can come together and share their experience. And that connectedness is really key to a positive attitude. So, um, so we know that those resources are out there. Thank you. Uh uh, Conwell, Sheila, I was just about to come to you because I, I love to hear what your agency specifically does for people who suffer from, unfortunately, that disease that, that you all support. Well, in, in talking with uh, caregivers who are caring for those with Alzheimer's disease and just talking about resources. So we do count, and say, thank you for saying it, Conwell, or leading to this, we count our, our support groups as one of the big resources that we offer. Um, that's a big part of my job and my colleagues in our area is to coordinate these groups that are actually run by volunteers, trained uh, facilitators of caregiver support groups. So um, we, we just, can't say enough about them. I think that I could, I think I said earlier before we started taping, I could tell a caregiver or give them resources or give them direction, maybe say it a few different times, a few different ways, and it doesn't sink in. But a fellow caregiver in um, a meeting where somebody's telling their story and you, that's what you hear finally, you heard it, you hear their story and you realize uh, a few different things. Well, hey, maybe that's a tip I could try with my loved one. Hey, uh, things aren't that bad for me. And that lifts a little bit of my burden out. You know, I'm, I'm there. And then maybe I want to help somebody else to actually um, give some of my advice or my tips or guidance. And, and I always tell people, we never know what the value is in our story until we tell it. And when you tell your story, I guarantee in, in one of our groups, we've always, almost every meeting, seen somebody come away with even seasoned caregivers. You hit a wall. You What else can I do? <laughs> what else can I do to get my loved one to go to bed or to get my loved one to stop this behavior or to get my loved one to stop repeating? You know, what else can I do? And um, so there, there's a lot of things you can hear other people's stories 
And then hopefully you listen to me when I say, you know, hey, let me tell you about, you know, behaviors. If, if your loved one is, uh, you know, um, trying to wander away from the house or is um, being aggressive or combatant or um, just not cooperating in ways that they used to cooperate, there's, there's a lot of education we can provide the caregiver Mm-hmm. not only through our caregiver support groups with each other, but also straight education programs that talk about how to ease these behaviors, what you can do, uh, what you might be doing to trigger them and what you can do to stop you know, triggering them and actually come from a different way. I'm, su- I'm sure both Marcus and Rashern, you can tell me more about that, but we, but we try our best to try to um, help caregivers in that way to um, share in our groups, but also continue the education. Rashern, uh, thank you, uh, Sheila. Rashern, I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, in in your particular situation with your wife, obviously you, you had your family uh, initially there to support. Um, did you ever feel um, that sense of isolation after your children left that you were kind of on your own? And if there was an opportunity to connect with other caregivers, um, how did you navigate that space? No, you know what, you're, you're, Sheila's absolutely right, and, and Conrad, uh, Conrad, um, the support network and group is so important. Even when I had the children uh, around me, my young adults, um, and we had our last one, as I said, uh, was 15 when my wife was diagnosed. But when she finally went off to college, it was really the two of us in the house and me working. Um, one of the things by this time I had learned is how important it is to reach out, ask for help, um, but more importantly, how important it is to associate with people who are going through the same issues that you are in the tips. Uh, I know when I became public with my wife's condition, um, you know, for about two years, I didn't tell anybody. I just tried to handle it. Mm-hmm. Once I told folks, not only did was I able to, one, uh, publicly go to support groups, which was important. Two, I got some of the best information ever from individuals in the group telling me, here's what you need to know. Uh, here, look out for this. This is what's coming next. This is how you can be prepared for it. Um, it was so important. And one of the things that led us to do in the county, in Prince George's County, was to make it dementia friendly so that we could start talking about it in groups. But more importantly, we could do activities together that our loved ones used to do by themselves. And for me, you know, my wife always went to church, but I just awkward trying to deal with her in church and everything else until I had a support group that says, okay, uh, we're all going on this Sunday and there's a support group at this church. Uh, There's Mm -hmm. one here. So I think that becomes important to get information to have a chance to talk to others and to know that, you know, you're not going through it alone. And in some cases, uh, you, you're handling better than you thought you were after talking to other people. <laughs> um, Conwell, you said something in your in your introduction uh, about the Rosalind uh, group about uh, this idea at some point, all of us will either be providing care (laughs) or caring for someone else, right, in in our lives. Um, I'm wondering, um, how how do we prepare ourselves to be care providers before it it happens, right? I am so glad that you're touching on this issue. Uh, I would say if there's something that's just at our core as an organization, it's that we want to change the narrative of how we discuss caregivers. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to make sure that we're seeing them, that it is not the caregiver of, it is the caregiver. They themselves are a vulnerable population. They themselves need preparedness and prevention. You know, we know, as I stated earlier, that they're skipping their doctor's appointments, that, you know, that they're, um, that, you know, in older populations, you have a, a pretty significant population of caregivers that that may pass away before their care recipient. And, you know, I think that they feel like they're not seen um, and they feel like their needs have to be second to the needs of a care recipient. Well, we need to really understand the shifting demographic in the country and we need to treat it as a public health issue. Um, You Mm. know, I mentioned social determinants of health prior, but we really do need to recognize 
being a caregiver increases your vulnerability to a number of issues. And so what can we do in some sort of public health campaign? Just think about what we've done with smoking or with, you know, with seatbelts. You know, there, there are all of these campaigns where we have made such a difference. We need to take that approach with caregivers. And we need to get at these issues of preparing for the inevitability, which is what, uh, which, which is what the former first lady always speaks of. Mm -hmm. Prepare for that inevitability and create from a policy standpoint those supports that really make it so that it's not always the Sophie's choice. You don't have to give up your job and care for a loved one. You don't have to give up your health and care for a loved one. There are other choices that can be made to support you. Um, I think that these are all really important discussions. That is going to be our approach to our discussions for decades to come. I would like to say less than one decade, because wouldn't it be nice if we solved it all? But we know that meaningful change takes time and and we have the patience. That's great. I wanted to piggyback off that, what Conwell said, such an important message. Um, the advocacy is a, almost always a grassroots effort. Um, and, and when people lift their voices and get involved, hmm. we make a really significant change. Um, I've been working in this field for my entire adult life and I started in disabilities and we would go you know down to the courts and we have our picket signs and we we state our case like this is the need that the change that we need for DDA this is the change that we need for IDD so I I encourage folks to uh, volunteer um, you know I'm a supporting member of the Maryland Association for Adult Day Services Education Committee um, I'm involved in the Commission of People for Disabilities from Montgomery County. Um, you don't have to be a provider. Um, you can be a family member. You can be just anyone to volunteer for these efforts to try to raise an awareness for the need for something like long-term care. That's awesome. We are almost out of time, but I want to give each of you uh, at least a uh, 30 seconds to a minute to kind of share any parting words uh, that you have uh, to our attendees today who have taken their time to sit in on this, I think a really healthy, robust conversation about healthy aging uh, in place. And so anything that you wanna share as, as we bring this to a close, um, I, I wanna give each of you uh, time to just kind of uh, give some pearls of wisdom. And I'm gonna be taking notes as I'm now a new caregiver and need to hear everything that you have to say as we kind of close this out today. Conwell, I'll start with you. I would say be kind to yourself. Be very kind to yourself and carve out that, that important time that, that puts you first. Um, it's, it's so important. And to anybody who is involved in caregiving or just give yourself a pat on the back and re always remember to find the joy in it because there's joy in this kind of connectedness. There's joy in giving to others. And so try to remind yourself that every day. For sure. I, I, would, I would say one, um, uh, Conwell is, is uh, very, is absolutely correct. And I wanna emphasize something that she said earlier about Sophie's choice. Um, this is not a Sophie's choice that you can care for a loved one and have a career. I think if anything we did as a family that was vitally important was to show the public that we didn't just you know, go home. I didn't just quit my job, go home and you know, sit with my wife. It was us as a family taking care of her, but also having a career, which was dealing with issues that were important to both of us. So there's a way to do both. You have to ask for help. You have to take care of yourself. And you definitely, definitely have to find the joy in every moment there is. I tell people I have, uh, have not been happier in my life than I am today. Thank you. Sheila. Uh, that, you're so inspiring, Rashern. Thank you so much. And, and I want to thank Easter Seals and James. This was a, a great time for me. So I'm trying to think about what I would uh, tell caregivers and you, you 
both Rashern and Conwell, you've said it so well so far. So Marcus, I apologize because I'm going to go with have patience and take a deep breath. I can't say that enough. I And we say that to caregivers anytime in a meeting. I'm, there's always a caregiver who is at the highest stress level um, in their story and their journey at that time. And um, so just taking a deep breath and counting to, you know, three and uh, or even longer and then go ahead and say what you're going to say and uh, to, to your loved one or uh, in the situation and just um, have patience with your loved one and have patience with yourself. Thank you, Marcus. All right, I'm in a tough spot, tough spot. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, would, uh, I would say just explore, you know, explore the resources, um, get familiar with some of the things um, that we've shared today, look at all of the websites, try to navigate it. And um, if you can't find what you're looking for, ask for help. Um, that's why we're here. Uh, many of the representatives on this call are, are very, very, very knowledgeable about, you know, where these resources are. So just, I would say explore um, and try new things. Now is gonna be um, an opportunity to do that because many programs are now reopening and now just getting back to being accessible to the community in general. So mm -hmm. um, now's a good time to explore. Well, thank you. Let me recap uh, to everyone who's watching, be kind to yourself, ask for help and help one another, have patience and take a deep breath and explore those resources and know that the Easter Seals is certainly here uh, to support you. I wanna thank our amazing panel of panelists for being with us on this afternoon. We really appreciate your words of wisdom, your expertise, your passion uh, for this subject matter and for sharing with us pearls of wisdom. Uh, we're at the Easter Seals are very uh, grateful that you have spent an hour of your time with us this afternoon. We look forward to our next uh, candid conversation uh, in the month of September. Uh, so we'll be sending out more announcements about that. Enjoy the rest of your day and remember to be kind to yourself. Thank you and have a great day.